Hey, okay, it's great to see everybody. I'm looking forward to our lesson presentations today. Uh, so these are the final two weeks that we have of doing this. So what we'll talk about on Monday is what should we do next? Like what's going to be most helpful for you folks? And we can also have some kind of workshops too where we just sort of take a look at some things. How do you use this program? How do you use that program? How do you how do you make stuff? I could show you some of the things that I use, but um, keep that in mind for Monday as we transition uh, to Hawaii. So I think we will spend a couple weeks looking at the program in Hawaii. I'll talk to some folks there and see if uh, anybody can come say hi to us. We'll, we'll see. They're, they're awful busy, but I might be able to grab one or two of them. And I have some have some time with, uh, with some of the folks over there. So, uh, any questions or anything we need to take care of? Okay, first one I see on my list is Kash Katas Yitroha. All right, Kashish. Um, can you hear me okay? Lovely. Uh, so I have uh, a fun little um, <clears throat> a fun little thing. Hold on, let me get it all set up here. So I have a little bit of a lesson plan. I haven't done this one yet, and it's sort of um, some technology I haven't field tested, but I think this would be pretty fun. Um, and it's using, uh, it's part of a larger unit, but it's, it's one lesson within the unit of using, um, songs as sort of a foundation to learn, um, some of the phrases within them. I felt like a lot of times we learn songs, um, and then we don't have, we don't take the time or, um, you ask the kids what these songs are about. <laughs> and sometimes they kind of have a vague idea what they're about. But I wanted to use that as sort of a foundation to teach some of the language within the song. So we have this lovely song, the um, language chant, and I believe it was composed by Kune or compiled. Um, and I love that. And um, I, I, I've referenced it before while teaching in classrooms. And that sort of became the spark of it. I did that during our summer, a summer camp I helped run for um, performing arts based uh, theater camp. So, um, hold on, let me share my screen real quick. So that's sort of the idea. And this, I think it can be done with many different, um, different, uh, one second, different songs. Oh, hello. <clears throat> oh, this is the wrong one. Darn it, this is the one uh, before I uploaded it to Google. Hold on. Just kidding. <laughs> I have a lot of different windows open. Ah, here we are. Here we go. So in my head, this is, um, I decided it was going to be between seven to ten different lessons. Um, and one of the things I've realized since working in the classrooms um, is just how short some of these lessons can be some of the time, especially by the, without transition. So I thought about half hour to 45 minutes per class uh, per instruction. Um, and like I said, this is a using this song in particular as a foundation to learn about um, not only the language within it, but also who these cultural, where these phrases came from, um, from the cultural leaders that they came from. Um, and uh, the languages and phrases within each of the uh, verses. And then you learn the whole song as well. So um, here's sort of a, a, a rough outline of um, what the week would look like, each of these being about a 45 minute session. Um, so day one would be the introduction to the song. Uh, you'd listen to a recording of the song or the instructor would, would drum and, and sing the song themselves. Um, the students can copy the rhythm of the drum beat um, to keep up along with them. And then we talk about who composed this song, um, 
I think that's important for them to know. And I wasn't sure if to use composed or compiled. So that's still something. Um, maybe I could get some advice from you, Clune. And then um, some of the basis of this is, is the posters that they they that were handed out, like in TCLL classrooms, um, with the different cultural leaders and where these quotes came from. So I thought that would be, it's really important to learn about who these people are and were. And so um, I, I wanted that to be part of the lesson as well. So having, talking about these posters, talking about who, what, who these people are and were, and uh, going over their names and pronunciations. And then for the end of the day one, you'd practice the song all together, whether they know it or not. Um, just, you know, hearing the song and working together, I think would be great. And then we get into um, day two, which is based on a program called GimKit. I'm not sure if people are, know what GimKit is. It's sort of like Quizlet, um, but the kids can either work competitively, um, where it's like a quiz-based game uh, with flashcards, or they can work as a whole classroom where you're running from lava and you earn money to... Uh, to escape the lava as a whole classroom and then you use that money to like buy a new platform or double your money or things like that and it's sort of fun we used it in in one of my classrooms before and i thought it was really cool and it could be um, just a good way to familiarize with um who uh who everyone is and um <clears throat> and uh and within the pictures and who they're what their name is so that would be a day two and here's lesson one day two so can you see gim kit right now so this is a uh, a 30-day tr free trial you can pay extra um if you're an, a teacher or a student and i think it would be something worthwhile if it's if it's something I, i'll use so you create all of these, um, like who is this, and then you have the right answers and wrong answers, and these pictures were taken from the posters that we found in the classrooms. Um, and then each of the kids, they all have their own devices probably, but they would get into GimKit Live and play each other competitively. So here's what a preview of what it would look like. I do say, yeah. Adusaya. So then you could use your money and you could do streak bonuses and things like this, power ups and themes that the kids can use their money and they roll over um, under their account. And so you, so you do these um, as a classroom and it helps you just familiarize the face with the name as well. Um, so say you get the name wrong, it takes the money away. And at the very end, you can run reports on um, on how the classroom in general is doing. And I think you can find individual reports depending on um, the student as well. <clears throat> so I thought that'd be really cool. So the first day would just be familiarizing yourself with um, with uh, the the cultural leader who um, and their names. So the next day, lesson two, um, let me go back. Jeez, this thing is right in the way. Um, so that was lesson, that was day number two, lesson three. Um, I thought familiarizing with the English translation and then you listen to the recordings of the language chant. Um, oh, day three is called familiarizing with the English translation. So you listen to the recording of the language chant or the instructor sings it again. Uh, we'll same thing as the play before the students are copying the drum beat. Uh, go over who the people in the pictures are. You could do another gim kit if you'd like. Um, and then it's going over what is being said within the song. Go over the translations and look specifically at the linguet. Uh, and then translate to the English, and then you play the second Gim Kit lesson.
And so this is just a preview of how it looks um, from the user's perspective. To take away to so, um, so you just go through and it has um, what the thing it is and then I have the recording so they can hear what it sounds like and then um, and still continue. It's hard not to sing it when you're <laughs> like I wanted to keep going when I was saying it. And then I have the association with the same picture, so they have the familiarity there. Um, and so it just keeps going on and on. So that's sort of the idea of that. And that was just sort of an idea of what GimKit could be and how it could be used within the classroom. So the, the following day is going over the, it's doing the reverse. Um, Whereas this one is uh, in Flinkit, you would see the English up here and then find the translation below. And uh, you, it would be a lot of review from the day before as well. Oh, man, this is so annoying. Oh, whoops. There it is. Um, and then... Um, and then I thought going over what do the words mean, and this is why it could be a seven day uh, lesson, but a lot of times when you, especially like a lesson plan is good for a 10 day session, uh, 10 continuous classes. <clears throat> so um, I thought it'd be great to go through uh, and figure out what each of the words means and really dissect what is being said. Uh, it's something that we've done in, in some of the Thinget classes before as well. and going over the translations, looking at the different words. And then you could take some of those words and um, for each of the verses, you could either do it as a verse or the whole song itself and um, take the words within the verse and uh, have those be with its own little gim kit as well and have translations there. And so you're learning what each of the words means. Um, and it sort of depends on time. If it's a, if you only have seven days to do it, then you you just do the whole song. But if you have ten days to really dissect everything, um, you would do each verse, each of the four verses, and spend one one day on each and go through the gim kit like that. And the very last, the tenth day um, of the of the, this lesson would be. Uh, completely compiled of all the gim kits sort of like a, a final review and um and that would be a fun one to work on as a classroom to sort of test where the classroom is so which away that's that's sort of uh what i had in mind um uh, if that made any sort of rambling sense <laughs> okay good cheese uh, who's gonna start the sandwich? Sandwich time. First of all, I love that song, and uh, it's cool to recognize the names of the speakers because I feel like that's something I'm always trying to do as a learner is memorize the names of the elders who help teach. So uh, I know I think that's super awesome. I think the people want to know where the lava comes into the game. <laughs> Yeah, actually, I played it um, in uh, in Kyle Whirl's class, and he had one for something else. But that's sort of where a lot of this idea came from. And when I saw that, I was like, "Oh, that's great! Like, this could be a great vessel for what I was thinking about." Because I was trying to do this on Quizlet before, but um, he had us running from lava, and I was just—I knew the answers. I mean, it was like a super early clink it class and i was going ding he's like we're hitting new world records and i was like oh maybe i shouldn't be playing he's like i have to speed up the lava because i don't i'm not even sure what it looks like on his end but i was like too honed in on the game but you're you're as a classroom running from lava and so if you start to slow down um the lava eats up the classroom and then that's your high score for the day and that's sort of fun it's like uh I don't know. But i'm not sure what exactly it looks like Let's play. <laughs> we'll try to do this some other time, like I think with four classes right now. But it's like, you know, um, it was fun. <laughs> yeah, I was curious what other folks were 
we're using. So there's, I saw GimKit and some folks are using Quizlet and some folks are using uh, Flipgrid. I know someone, another student was talking about using Basecamp and uh, some, there was a YouTube user who was saying, you guys should have a Discord. And like, there's so many things that I'm like, okay, let's have all the things. But then it's sort of like, well, what should the things be? And so just uh, in terms of, you know, the tools are out there to do so much stuff. And so, but it's just a matter of like getting, and also keeping a critical mass of folks who are doing the thing. But there, there's lots of those tools that are out there for, for teaching and for memorization. And they're, they're so great because you can add audio and you can add video to them. Awesome. Other thoughts? It's a cool way to learn uh, a bunch of other songs too when you get more more songs in there. Because there's, I have a tough time remembering some songs that I sing or even a whole bunch of them or you know, where it gets to like, hey, can you lead a song? I'm like, I, I don't want to. But that would help right there in that, in that aspect of learning that song more. Pretty cool. Good cheat. Okay. Great. Yeah, when it comes to songs, like these are things uh, I want us to think about, like in all of our language programs, like how many of these songs, you know, like finding the right balance between old songs, and newer songs, or making songs, and then incorporating kind of either pop music that gets translated over or uh, nursery rhyme songs, which sort of, there's a whole bunch of them that just follow these melodies. Like, um, you know, there's there's a ton of them right out there and they're, they're real easy to sort of do. But one thing that happens with a lot of programs is they end up just using the same sort of nursery rhyme sort of melodies, which I think is a good starting place. But it's then at some point you've got to transition to just making your own songs. And then as a group of people, you got to figure out also like what's the thing, like the drum is kind of the thing for Southeast Alaska. So the drum comes out and then the kids usually know and, and there's sort of a visual element with the drum. And sometimes the kids have their own drums, but then that could get super loud and pretty out of control pretty fast but then in terms of like um using i think music is a really good way to teach the language but then also sort of when you come out of that like teaching like there's the language has tones as well and, and i think most of our languages have some sort of tone to them that just sort of gets thrown out the window a little bit once we put it into music because then you're just going to match this melody so it's it's really neat to think about so that that song um on monday when we start class we'll i'll have you folks listen to like how they start their day in the in the hawaiian medium school navahi and uh, we'll just listen to it before we start the class and then but as i sort of watch that and i watch this same chant that they did i was like oh man we should have like a chant like that that's sort of like pushes us into this realm of learning and for them they were asking their ancestors permission to learn and uh, it was very powerful to see it and they i saw it over there from preschool through phd programs people are singing this same song and then a whole series There's, they've got a whole series and for them they have and we have you know most of us we have these as well these songs with rattles songs with drums songs you know and there's also different paces and different other things uh, to them. So these are things that should be incorporated, but whatever your language program is, you have to figure out which songs do we use? How do we use them? Uh, and, and then there's, there's some other stuff too. Like if you have sensitive songs, like if you, if you had songs like this is only to be sung by Haida people, but if there's non Haida people there and they're singing it, there's a pretty good chance they're just going to take it and sing it somewhere else anyways. So the, those are some things to keep in mind. It's, but I don't think that's a reason to not teach it. But then also if you're dealing with your kids in your program, like you, you want them, you know, coming back to program identity is like songs are a big part of program identity. And so, and, and some of that is composing new ones and some of that is having this whole set of older songs so that when there's some cultural event and this comes back to that cultural c uh, concept is they know what to do once the song starts like they know what to do 
And um, yeah, so those are some of the things I was thinking of. Anyone else, other thoughts? I think just hearing that part makes me think, you know, having, and this, this is sort of based on something I've done before too, but having like the physicalities and specific dance moves to different, like if you do have this one song that's composed having you know specific dance moves that are memorized for certain parts um i think would be really interesting and a lot of this is sort of based off of it's it it's cool that you were saying that with the hawaiians but it was also um my wife and i were talking one time and she was like i can't remember if it was spanish or latin or something but she went to a private catholic school and every day it started off with you know they're singing these songs in spanish or latin and she's like, and that's what we learned. We, she's like, I don't speak Spanish or Latin, but she's like, I knew every one of those songs and I knew what it meant. Hmm. Um, and it's because they sang it every day. <laughs> you know, it was like, here's how you start your days with this song. And I was like, oh, that's, there's something interesting to that. Yeah. What? Um, something I wanted to mention too, uh, about like, if it's an older song, like, um, you know, an older song that has meaning to a clan, especially, I think, should be done. Um, I was watching that Celebration 82, Hunakawu, they were doing a Fuakan Hashiyi, and he was talking about it, and someone in the crowd got up, and then Plinget was telling him, uh, now, you know, because of everything that's happened to all of our people, the Fuakan feathers can't open up in peace, because there is no peace right now. We've lost so much to that. And he said, yeah, it's not going to be. We're just going to do it for so people see it and the way he danced the whole time, he just held the feathers there and he never opened it up, which he conveyed that in, in the, in the thing, but I don't see why you couldn't do that in the game too, but kind of have that in there for spirit songs. Yeah. Well, like there, there's a whole, you know, Nora Downhar once said you could teach the entire clinky history through song. And so continuing to sort of figure out what the, what's going to be the breadth of, of songs for them to know? Because that's another thing in Hawaii, they've got like a million songs. And then you watch this, the kids in the class and they start singing some song and all the kids know which dance to do. They just start doing the thing. You're like, wow. You know, and so this comes back to this high fluency in, in music. And so as we think of this stuff, like I want you to think about this, like what are, like, let's say, you built a K through 12 school that was like totally 100% in, in, in indigenous language. When those kids graduate, what do they know? And I want you to really think hard about that. What do they know? And what's the order in which they learn them? When do they start learning the spirit imitation songs? And when do they start learning uh, cry songs? And when do they start learning these other? And, and for, uh, for all of us, it's going to be a little different. Like our the types of songs we have might be a little bit different, but I would say overall in general, the level of cultural knowledge is so low among the population of indigenous peoples. Like that is also at a critical juncture. Like what's going to happen with, do we know what to do when, when someone just finds out like one of their relatives passed away or do we know what to do when, when something wonderful happens and do we you know can we compose new songs for all all these different things and still continue to build this repertoire of of older things and yeah and competitions like i know competitions were a big thing like there's all these dance competition songs but usually there's no competition we just kind of watch someone else dance you know but like how do we bring this stuff kind of back in a way that's healthy but that's also you know, and then there's a whole bunch of things like with uh, native games and other, th you know, there should be some gambling games, perhaps we should start bringing this stuff back and, and like stick gambling, like this used to happen all up and down the Northwest coast. And I don't think there's any coastal communities that I know of in Alaska that still know how to do that stuff. And so, so it's a, it's a big, it's like, you're, you're trying to take inventory of everything you need to do. And you also need to make sure you're not overwhelmed to the point where you don't get anything done, but that you divide this work among the group. And so as, as we come in, we keep thinking about these big documents we're going to create at the end of this semester. It should be talking about just this kind of stuff. 
Is there, can we, and then the roles of who's in the school, what do they do? Is there a keeper of the songs? Is there a keeper of the, is there a gambling master? Like every time you walk by like a person's office, you just lose a watch or something, you know, you just like something happened, you know, but just bringing this stuff back. And then also like on a date, like how do you start your day? So when I think of that school in Hawaii, one of the things that you learn if you really get to know how things operate there, there's no bell, there's no intercom system, and there never will be. They have a conch shell, so somebody blows that when the older students blows that in the morning, and that's the signal for everybody to gather. And then they have a ceremony, an opening ceremony every single day then they go start their day and then the teachers guide them through the rest of the day. There's no bell ringing and, and stuff like that, but uh, we got to move on to the, to the next. Uh, I didn't get that. Could you try again? No, my, my devices keep talking. Okay. No, leave me alone. <laughs> okay. So, uh, yeah, wonderful. Uh, the one one thing I would also add is um, Cyril George has two names and Kachkawu is the one that I was told we should, Kakak is another one of his names. It refers to an arch that's in Basket Bay. Um, yeah, great stuff. Okay. Uh, Lauren, it is your turn. Ja. Um, okay, one second. So my idea is to use um, like to have like weekly vocabulary categories and then to have students create stories using a specific number of the of the vocabulary. Um, they could use things that they already know and each week, oops, each week I'll um, add a new category to be used and students can build upon previous stories or create new ones every with each new category. Um, this is targeted towards intermediate or advanced learners. Um, I don't know about specific age groups because I really, being in high school pretty recently, I feel like high schoolers wouldn't want to do this or <laughs> middle schoolers because they just like, that's just how they are. But so like, students everybody has a different way that they like to learn and um, a different um, preference for art so students can um, are encouraged to use form line in addition to storytelling but they could also create videos using vocabulary if they're into that kind of thing or if they just prefer oral storytelling or they create can create comics or songs um, and spelling isn't important but comprehension is and I just want students to be able to use this as a fun creative way to learn sentence structure and um, new vocab and then here's just an example so like um, one category would be eating and cooking and then another would be kin terms so like this is just someone talking about how their mom is a good cook and they're helping their mom cook um, and yeah that's it Yay. Logging. Uh, who's starting the sandwich? I, didn't have I really appreciate that you made it inclusive and in all the different ways that they can um, make their little, I don't know, vocab word. Or so the different ways that they can use to remember it. Ganesh cheese. Yeah, I really like the idea. Uh, I understand what you're saying about uh, with high school kids, but also with opening up the possibilities with um, doing things like uh, comic books and graphic novels and, and storytelling through those mediums, I think you might actually get some of those, uh, some of those kids that originally might not want to participate if it were just straight oral or just written. Um, it might have a little bit more appeal there. So yeah, having those options is great. Hello. Yeah, I've been in a few classes too in uh, Huna and over here in Juno where students have uh, 
kind of just mixed their own art style and put some form line in there and uh, created just like part of a paragraph or something. And they built up a whole storyboard of, you know, whatever story we were reading about. And it'd be cool to do that in other languages too. And, uh, just to see what they come up with. Can I sheesh? Yeah, when, when? Yeah, when? Okay. Oh, I was just gonna say, um, I like it because I think it, it takes it beyond just learning a vocab word and memorizing a vocab. Um, the element of adding, creating your own story or making sentences out of those newly learned vocabs and building on what you know is awesome. Like just to start building those sentences because in Hunt Kill, it's pretty intimidating for me to build the sentences. So having practices and small exercises like that is great. Um, and I would even say like, if you're going for younger students maybe, or maybe more earlier beginners, it might be awesome to have a few prompts or a few example questions with fill in the blank maybe. So they could kind of get an idea of the placement of where those vocabulary might fit into the sentence. Um, but I loved it. I love I loved the sentence aspect of it. How? How? Uh, I, um, that was the same kind of critique I had in mind uh, that what Sanja just shared. And I just wanted to piggyback on to what she said and how um, it's great that you have included um, your strategy in regard to the verbs. Um, I think it's great because like it can, it can help hard to kill learners to like, to ex extend their vocabulary using like the same sentence structure. I know that's something that's working for me and it's going really well. Quick uh, one, how about? How Fabulous. Uh, oh, did, did anyone else have a thought? Okay. Uh, yeah, so sto stories are so wonderful. Uh, and, and similar to the conversation we just had about songs, we're going to have to think about stories and the inventory of stories and which are there particular stories that we're going to expect every child to know. And, and just sort of to talk at a, what we're trying to do here. So there's going to be the stuff that we're going to make right now. Right, so we're gonna say, okay, we're gonna use this for this type of thing. But if if you want these languages to really be thriving, we're gonna have to construct an entire education system for each of these languages. And we're just gonna have to figure out how to do that. And the reason I bring that up is because we're also going to have to envision the teenagers that we could have 20 years from now which in some ways is not fair for our experiences and what we went through for education. It's also not fair for what the current generation is going through. But the reality is that most of the education systems that indigenous peoples go through, the older they get, the more the system itself completely disregards indigenous content. And so also, what we're seeing now, the level of interest, the level of commitment, the level of knowledge, for a teenager is probably going to be different than the teenager we would construct in a school that we built ourselves. They would still be teenagers. You're, there's still going to be a whole bunch of stuff you have to figure out. And you're going to have to teach them about a whole bunch of stuff in your language, which is, you know, just stuff that you got to teach young people. But at the same time, you would be able to build them up. And so what I, when we get to stories, when, my one thing is like, find the really big version, the big full version of the story and then start to scaffold it down so create a little baby board book version of it then create another and so like it's the same story and and here's one of the keys is like a lot of times uh the colonial world is like i heard that story tell me a new one i heard that story tell me a new one i heard that story tell me a new one instead of spending time with these stories like we are expected to so the other thing is like really realizing what these stories are doing. And it's a lot more complicated than there's a moral in the story. Like it's more complicated than that. Uh, like I was reading this um, old version of Nana Simgit 
And, you know, and at the end, they're like, and then he put his wife in a box. I was like, wait, what? I, this is usually where the story ends. I was like, why did he put her in a box? And then he put that box in another box. And he put that box in another box. And then he forgot about her. And then he remembered her and he went to get her out of the box and she had chewed a hole through the boxes and was gone. And roll credits, right? And I was like, whoa, you know, so there's so much depth to these just in terms of content, culture, and language. So some of the things that um, there's a group in uh, out of Atlan that's doing some really neat things where they'll write these kind of short, simple versions of stories too for for new learners, adults. And they will memorize the entire story. It's probably like 20, 30 lines. And they'll be able to just, they can't speak the language, but they can tell you this story. So there's some neat things you could do with that as well. And then also use this for your second language learners to give them a framework to tell their own basic stories. Yesterday I went to the store, they're out of cheese. Like what, whatever, it doesn't have to be some big, huge, huge story, just a day-to-day -day stuff because so much of what we do is sharing narratives, right? Oh, let me tell you, I gotta tell you what happened, you know? Uh, and, and then that way that gives them a day-to-day -day thing. So yeah, there's there's so much you can do with stories. It's such fun territory. Uh, and then I agree, it gets you to the deep part of the language where you're really making lots of connections and figuring out how these things work, which is intimidating because a lot of us uh, who are second language learners, like we start teaching these big stories and then a student's gonna say, what's this? I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> and I was like, that's a master storyteller who's telling you that stuff so very exciting very exciting to see this being used oh any other thoughts yeah yeah so there, there's a lot of stuff that's being done as well if you look at what the mohawk really started doing they, they transitioned over the past, no, maybe 10 years from trying to teach whole, whole language to teaching a whole bunch of little chunks of language. So a bunch of stuff is color coded so that they'll really see the, the grammar that's there. And so like we've been trying some of this stuff with, with Tlingit this semester. It's for like, okay, we're gonna learn some of these things. Now go look for these things as we read this story. And so the, one of the ways you can use this story is you've got this big long story and you've got maybe the Haida on one side and the English, they're just right next to each other. And just everybody takes turn reading one sentence at a time. And then you've got the translation right there. So then you could say, okay, anything you recognize in here or anything you want to talk about? That way that sort of choose your own adventure when it comes to exploring the grammar of it. But then you could do other things where you say, okay, now we got this other story and we're only going to show you the Haida. And you got to read it and then tell me what you think it means and we'll we'll translate it for you if you don't get it so you, you got to do those things in real low pressure environments so that people don't feel bad if they don't know or they don't get it wrong uh, one of the techniques i'll use a lot is i'll say okay uh, you read it just tell me anything you recognize i don't ask them to translate i just say tell me tell me what you recognize in there and then they'll maybe figure out a few things and if they're stuck then i'll tell the rest of the class help them out just to see if anybody else knows you know and so one of the things you'll also have to manage as a teacher is how do you and you know i'm not an expert at this but how do you keep everybody involved and everybody going because you might have one person who's just real excited and is answering every single question and you might have to tamp them down a little bit and say okay let's uh let's give other folks a chance you know and so usually i'll do that by saying okay everybody does one and now and it's a little more challenging through Zoom sometimes. But also another thing to think about is when do you start calling on people? And when do you start having them say it on their own? And those are some things to, it'll be different for, you know, what they do in those schools in New Zealand and Hawaii, it's, it's different because those, those kids already know the language, right? It's a, it's a whole different universe. And so that's that's the world we're trying to create where the kids already know the language and we're just getting them deeper and deeper into the content. But for a lot of us, it's a huge mystery 
on how to do that. But what we're really talking about here, the process, is you would build a, a language nest, and then a kindergarten, then a first grade, then a second grade. But where a lot of programs run into hard times, which I think the Ojibwe article was touching on, is what if you're not able to keep up with the production of teachers? What are you going to do? Every, everybody's going to start getting burned out. And as a learner, if you're in there teaching kindergartners all day, it doesn't always push your own language skills, and especially if you're not doing a whole language environment. So a bunch of different thoughts. So. OK, anything else? Okay, uh, next, uh, Dave Lang. <clears throat> All right, who keeps do I you, Dave Lang? Do I am, come to am. My language that I'm working with is Somalia, um, but uh, the format that I want to work with with these lesson plans would work uh, with any of our any of our native languages um my target group is uh 13 and over 13 and up um with uh it, it could be starting from the beginning from a, a, a introductory level but um if kids already have a grasp of uh the language and quite honestly, if they have a grasp of the language, but they've grown a little maybe uh, distant from their enthusiasm on it, these are the kind of activities that I want to try and and uh, get those kids' enthusiasm back back in it, as well as adults and, and adults being able to uh, to have fun here. So let me see if I can pull up. I need to. Oh no. I got to figure out my permissions here. I'm trying to share screen. Give me just a second here. Okay, no worries. I don't know why it's only showing, I don't know why it's only showing the one. Oh, manage, there we go. Suck more photos. Uh, albums. Okay. So the game is uh, Hoax Newsom. Uh, I invented it. It's a uh, it's a uh, who done it. Uh, actually, of course, I'm not. Uh, I'm just joking. The game is Among Us. Uh, Hoax Newsom would be how we would say it in Somaliac. And uh, in the game, and using it as a uh, as a place to go from we have it's a whodunit game where it starts off with uh i think it's eight to well you can have as little as three but up to i believe 10 people per game and in those we should be oh man i'm trying to trying to share my photos dang it So within this too, you have colors, you've got a little bit of clothing that differentiates from each other. So there's vocabulary that you have around that. And at a very base level, even if that was only what the lesson was, if you were just working on colors, you could play this game and communicate it that way. What the base of the game is, is that there's one, two, three imposters, depending on the size and the rest are crew members that are trying to uh, participate in tasks and keep from getting killed by the imposters. Uh, the imposters are, oops, excuse me. I, I'm so bad at the tech. The imposter, their job is to run around and kill the crew members. while running through these maps.
And so in the maps, you have a bunch of different rooms and a bunch of different tasks you can be doing in the ship. Uh, so there is another area where we have vocabulary for different rooms, for our kitchen, for our admin, for our office, for uh, what, and we'd probably have to come up with words for communications, for electrical, and things like that. Part of the challenge of this game and something that would come up very quickly is, is figuring out how to communicate certain things that we don't have words for. Um, so there's gonna be a little bit of language formulation on that, like our, our name for, uh, or our word for uh, computer. Even that one is, is, oh, I just wrote that down. It's a, uh, oh, geez, where'd it go? Had me some knock knock. Yeah, had <laughs> me some knock knock is a, is a kind of long one that I found. And uh, that's, that's like spirit in a box and things like that. So putting together the vocabulary for this could also be a building exercise that uh, if you start with colors, then the next time before you play with a group of people, you could say like, all right, how are we going to express different rooms? Who is suspect? And uh, it's a voting game when somebody finds, for anybody who hasn't played, when somebody does find uh, a body after somebody has killed one of the other people, then you gather up and again, communicate by discussing and getting together in a group and discussing who you think is suspect, who would be the liar or the imposter, hookbisk, hookbisk in this case, uh, where the body was found, what room, if they found it in the medical or in, uh, in the admin or the office. Again, there's a lot of, um, a lot of vocabulary that could go around that uh, inside, outside, who's suspect. And then also at this point, after the discussion is made, then people vote and they vote somebody to say like, I believe it was, I think it was blue. I think it was Gwisquask. And so if everybody thinks it's blue, then they vote blue and blue is then ejected from the game. Um, here too is another really interesting element of the game in that when they eject from the game, uh, it is strictly up to the voting of the group. And it occurred to me as I was thinking about this that not only um, once people vote and if they vote somebody out, Yes, they can be voted out because they are suspect, but also too, as this game progresses and people want to keep it more and more immersed in language and it does get to an actual um, like full immersion level, you could eject somebody out for speaking English or if they're not <laughs> keeping up to the language goals of the game. Uh, and so that's an interesting side uh, option of a way to play this game and keep it within language. Um, like I said, uh, the communication is just, there's a bunch of different tasks and things like that, that, that you can do and base language around, um, base vocabulary language around like the different tasks like this, you're connecting the different wires, but if you, um, you could use that to say mulks for red and and uh, 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 all the different colors and, and different uh, vocabulary surrounding that. And it's something that could build both vocabulary and actual syntax and expression into a full immersion type thing if you have uh, more advanced students. And since it's a game, you know it's it's nice because you could always um, it would be one of those kind of, it could potentially be one of those sort of Friday activities for, uh, for classrooms and things like that to where they have something to kind of look forward to at the end of the week, the longer they stay in language or the more the language advances, the more time they have to play 
things like that. And I, I just see it as a, a, a really good potential uh, tool where kids are already using it. It's something they already know how to play. They already know what to do. Um, a lot of kids. Uh, and like I said, kids who maybe aren't uh, uh, as enthusiastic for playing other games that are really easy to play in language like sorry or something like that where it's simple numbers and colors and stuff these are the kind of things that might be able to uh uh help uh ring back in some of the kids that uh maybe have lost a little bit of enthusiasm and uh adults young adults everybody that i know pretty much that plays video games loves to play this game so yeah, there's my uh, my idea based on the vocabulary and uh, and syntax and strength, sentence building around this game because there is such a, a rich variety of different things that we could do and uh, and expression to an immersion level. Um, I'm also working on a uh, a um, combat and. Uh, 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 construction simulator called Wabam Act uh, Fortnite for uh, for uh, in English. So anyway, that's my uh, that's my pitch. Um, uh, who's gonna start our our sandwich? I said Noom Hukinsk. Uh, that was great. I um, enjoy how interactive your um, lesson plan is going to be. And um, I personally don't have any critiques because I'm not that big of a gamer, but I just like, I really like when, you know, my friends and family are happy and games happen to be something that makes them happy. Um, but I do have a couple of questions. Um, so with incorporating a language, like what program are you going to use? With that, um, I mean, potentially, uh, unfortunately, when I was thinking about this, I was thinking of more of an in-person, in-class, uh, uh, um, in-person uh, structure. But as far as the actual presentation of the language, and uh, um, are you talking about like uh, so they can hear the the uh, examples and things like that? Yeah, yeah, like on the on the computer. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, I'm honestly I haven't worked out the uh, uh, the technical end of of that because yeah. when I'm picturing it, I pictured it more like going over vocabulary in person on a blackboard or something like that. But it's something that I need to consider is of the uh, more of a digital presentation and then having audio files too, to back up these uh, words. So we can have not just uh, whoever the instructor's voice is, but a variety of voices saying the, the uh, 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 saying the words. So you get not just a uh, one voice, but taking in a, a few different ones. You can log in. Okay. My last question is like, when <clears throat> um, language learners younger than 13 feel that they're ready enough, like, are you going to be uh, like, are you going to be open to them joining in as well? I just said 13 because it's based around a, a cartoonish murder. Oh, yeah. If the, anybody oh, has, yeah. Had, if anybody had a, uh, my kid plays it, he's 10. And he loves it. He plays it all day long. But uh, I, I put that age in there only strictly because that I felt like that was an age where um, uh, uh, usually uh, in the gaming areas, that's sort of your your must be this high to play games with guns or or an idea, even if a cartoony one of uh, of murder, which which this undeniably has like talking about what room the dead body was in and things like that. It's Unclad. digital clue. It's sort of digital short attention span clue in like who did it and what room and, and things like that. But 
even even that same thing like clue is actually based around bear or deer so some parents might uh not might not agree with that at an age below that and that's the only reason why that's that i put in that age and also that is i mean a, a side thing on that is that is kind of an age where um people lose a, a lot of kids lose enthusiasm enthusiasm for a lot of things that are around school you know you lose kids that start out into sports or start out into being uh, participating in a language or or uh plays or you know school groups and stuff like that so that was another kind of side benefit of that age but really anybody it would work for for anybody okay i'll uh Well, uh, Lugo and Nogo Hisashida, um, I liked your work. Um, one of the things that I heard from other high school teachers is um, it goes towards, what is the game again? I think it's, it's not Fortnite. Um, it has like mind in it. Oh, Minecraft. Minecraft. Yeah. <laughs> Um, some of the teachers yeah. hide the vocabulary words in Minecraft where they have to oh. go f find them. So I thought that was <laughs> that was another thing to add where you could hide your vocabulary words. And That's I would really, probably really be smart. the first one to get kicked out if um, I was speaking too much English in the games. <laughs> Just knew you. I thought that was a good idea. We <laughs> Awesome. Yeah. And so like, really, to kind of continue the theme is we're going to have to build the inventory of all these things. Like, so like indigenous languages, it's so interesting because for a lot of other languages, the stuff's already there. Like, you know, you can get all these board games in, in different languages and stuff, but we can, we can certainly take these concepts and just make our own board games and make our own. And and what I, what I hope we'll continue to think about is someone develops the concept, which is a template, which then can be applied to the to other languages. It's sort of like, oh yeah, okay. So then we just sort of, and there's um, gamecrafter.com is a website where you can make your own whole board games. Like you just sort of take, a, you know, it's, it's a little daunting to sort of think of a concept and then apply it over. But also if you're playing sort of a lot of the online video games these days, it seems like they most of the interaction is them talking to each other anyways. And so they could just switch the language that they're using and you have the whole video game already built for you. And so like as I was yeah. watching my kids play like uh, on the Nintendo Switch, like there's hardly any speaking in any game. Like usually you just have to read it anyways. And so uh we just sort of just say okay we'll do this in our language so that that opens up a whole realm of possibilities in terms of online stuff and also in the room type of stuff so it's, it's really exciting to think about um the types of things we'll do and then the age specific types of things so we can what would we could do something whether that's candy land but not all candy like it could be just we could be traditional foods and and um i know that there was a game developed in Atlin, where you had to go somewhere and you had to know the place name of that area and then you also had to know what type of foods you would harvest in that area and then and so it just sort of played on those types of things and then always trying to keep one step ahead of the kids because you know things will be cool for a second and then they'll be on to the next <laughs> so that's the, yeah that's the other thing. Like, originally one of my original idea um that i set out to look at and it not that it was a uh i think it was a bad one but it was to do like native mad libs and use the mad libs template as a as a learning tool and then i looked into that and turns out mad libs has a whole second language teaching wing of it so there's already so much stuff in place that it would merely be like adapting it it wouldn't be uh developing the lesson is the lessons are there and they have them developed uh for english as a second language to learn spanish to learn french to learn all these different things it would just be um uh you know modifying them more to the language than than uh building a lesson around them because they have teacher workbooks and 
a whole, like I said, I didn't realize that Mad Libs had a whole educational side of it. So just an interesting side note for future stuff. That's great. Oh, excellent. Yeah, I'd love to do Mad Libs in our languages. That'd be so much fun. Uh, other thoughts, ideas, feedback? Yeah, um, you know, I've, um, I've heard, you know, my uh, younger, younger uh, sister play some games. In this case, it was with Herb's uh, daughter. And I heard, Maisie, I mean, Kach, 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 I have a little stutter there. Yeah, yeah, I know, yeah. But, um, and then, uh, so it, it is cool when that, like, everyday life gets uh, applied into a game. And, um, you know, it is nice that, you know, if they are playing among us, if this does get implemented out there and, you know, they have this and, you know, if it's in cards or the photo and they can have it next to them and they're playing the game and then something that's an everyday interaction, you know, turns into, you know, them speaking Clinkit, calling each other in their Clinkit names and it works out. So, yeah, I have to do like a Clinkit uh, Sims BYOV, you can build your own village. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, the other thing too is um, in the classroom, it's fun, a fun tool, but also too, if these kids play the game outside of it, the idea is going to hit them too sooner or later, hopefully, that this is their, their, their code talkers. They get to like, they got a little secret, secret advantage to talk to somebody else that Gumshwa can't understand. So little extra benefit that's great um uh, well over a decade ago one of my younger cousins came to visit us and he was he really liked this game uh, it was fun it's like um ghosts splinter cell so, something and and you like you really helped each other out and you had to sneak around real quietly and go like assassinate people and do stuff i i don't re remember but there was a there was a version where you can set up a microphone and then you could talk to each other. And it was really funny because he was pretty young, but then he was saying to me like, I wish we had the microphone so we could talk to each other. And I said, we're in the same room. <laughs> we, can, we can talk to each other, you know? But yeah, but now here we are where the kids, the only way they currently have to be is, is connected through. So, you know, again, like there's the right now, which is gonna be trying to figure out like, how do we do this over Zoom or whatever, but there could, there could be whole game nights and stuff. And, and it's sort of like where your language using community uh, and maybe they're not, not everybody's playing the same game, but you have these pockets of folks who are playing games. I think uh, telestrations would work really well in our language where basically if you got eight people, you start with eight pieces of paper and you just write a sentence and then you pass it to the person and then they have to draw it. And then you pass it and then someone has to look at the drawing and try and figure out what the sentence was and it's pretty fun so it's, it's like it changes pretty dramatically um i was i did it and uh there's a really great like comic artist i was sitting next to but she didn't know what a pod of killer whales was so she drew these killer whales hosting a podcast you know and so and then it just sort of spun out of control from there but like um yeah it sounds fun so maybe one thing for us to consider is uh, next week is our last uh, group for these this first set of lesson presentations. So maybe the Wednesday after that, we just have a a game game day. So we'll all just try out different games on each other, or pick one and try it out in our diff different languages that are present here. So uh, just kind of a fun sort of good job getting through the first set of uh, presentations type of thing. But uh, we got twenty minutes left, so we'll turn it over to Kuchain and eat Koha. Uh, great job, everybody. Wonderful stuff. Uh, I could see. Uh, let's see. Go to. Okay. All right. So this is a Clinkit face lesson. Um, oh, heck. Sorry about that. Oh my gosh. I got rid of all my tabs so I wouldn't do that. Okay. 
So this is a click at face lesson. Can you guys still see that? No, I think it's not sharing the screen right oh, now. Oh, okay. I went in and out of Zoom. Sorry. Okay, let's try that again. All right, here we go. Uh, all right, here we go. So clink it face. So I kind of set this up um, for the clink it language, obviously, but then uh, for multiple age groups, because the unique thing with art is that you're kind of dealing with a multitude of folks, um, their exposure can be very young. And sometimes it's folks wanting to start when they're older. Um, so I started off with basic nouns. Oh, nouns just for folks who want to know what they're drawing. And, um, <clears throat> and then, you know, more nouns. But then I have some teaching phrases. So depending on your medium, you can say he or she drew, painted, or carved any of these nouns up here. So it gives you some flexibility room. And then going from there, if you're working with more um, advanced speakers, you can use uh, these teaching phrases is what I call them. So that um, the goal is post COVID or even now if you're doing it over Zoom, um, if you're in a carving or art setting, you and your mentor can use these directions back and forth. And I was kind of thinking about what you're saying, uh, Hune, about how a lot of things haven't been taught in Clinkit and to really get back to that so that you know things from start to finish measurement steps uh, a lot of the hard vocabulary um, is at least there available on a wall so that you can look at it and not need to revert back to english um, so you know he or she drew his or her eyelid it extends around it Ach, yawashu. so you could take some of these phrases and combine them and yeah, and then stepping into the art section, I just have a step by step on how to draw a clinket face utilizing all the vocab that um, is there so you can see how it plays out. Um, just set your ovoid. Uh, different people start with different things. I usually start with the mouth. And Hune has something kind of like this on his website where there is a nice step by step video. And that kind of inspired me to put some vocabulary with it. So yeah, and then it gets to about here. And then, yeah, you're halfway there. Step 10, hoo-ha, you're halfway there. So yeah, and then that gives folks the option to transfer it over to the other side if they haven't done this sort of thing before. If this is a younger age group, my kind of thought was maybe we could take a face template, print it out, and let them try and match it over to the other side. Because that's, for me, the hard part about this art form is matching things to the other side and just getting those motions down is a good start. And then if folks are older or have done this art form, they get to do the, you know, all those steps uh, one through 10, including hoo-ha at home. So yeah, go sheesh. Okay. Go sheesh. Who's going to start the sandwich? I guess it doesn't always have to be a sandwich, but I still like that idea. That was super cool. It sounds like, um, you know, you've been working hard on your drawing. So it's cool to see you incorporate that into your curriculum. And um, something I keep saying I'm interested in is task-based learning. And I think it's called domain reclamation too. And so it's cool for, for me to see um, an example of what that looks like with what you've done. Like these are the words you need to know for a drawing lesson. And then seeing how you would incorporate that into teaching drawing. And I haven't seen, I haven't like worked on something like this yet. And uh, it's pretty inspiring. So goodness cheese. It's Jewish. Okay. Anyone else? Yeah. I really like. Uh, oh, sorry. Oh, no good. I really like this idea, and it would be awesome to see it in our languages <laughs> in Jamalia too, and Hadkil. Um, 
just for a, a starting point for all our languages, that would be awesome. Well, um, I'm not sure. I, I was using the Carrie Edwardson dictionary and then some folks with Edwards, uh, I mean, and then some folks with their own uh, dictionaries. But if you wanted to, I could save that as a template and get rid of the space, but then include the English parts and then send it to you to translate. Oh, um, I am. That would be good. Yeah, I think it's cool seeing just more artists making the same, you know, not the same thing, but like the walking through art, like how it's done by different people. That way you see how everybody makes a face. Everybody makes it different. Everyone starts somewhere different, uh, lays it out. Uh, everybody does it different. And it's it's cool to see that from all over the place. Because I think the few that are out there are like this is two or three people put them together and they just kind of changed what they had for them or made it a little bit more detailed, but I, I definitely like seeing it. And then transferring that face, that is the tough part. Um, our kids always say they want to draw an ovoid without tracing paper. And I'm like, who draws without tracing paper? <laughs> Nathan Jackson. <laughs> yeah. I seen him use tracing paper. <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> it's all me. It's, it's all, you got to cut file folders, <laughs> shape or so. <laughs> But I really like uh, the way these things are tying together today because it brings me back to this idea, like if you're going to build a program, you have to build up every one of these subject areas. So look at what we did today. We did, we did the music class. We did the story class. We did the so literature. We did the art class and we did the games. And so it's sort of like just starting to build this all up. And I keep coming back to this idea as well. I think we all do. Like what if there is a single publishing house so that the concept was developed and then we've got these fill in the blank areas. So it's like, okay, yeah, translate these concepts for us. And then we, we at least have, and it's gonna be probably a pretty bare bones thing. Cause what we're gonna find is like, if you wanna teach someone how to draw that completely in the language, it's gonna, there's gonna be a whole bunch of stuff. And this is why, task-based learning, learning and domain reclamation are really fun because you're like, oh, I don't know how I'd say erase that line and move it up a little bit. It's curving too much right here. It's getting, it's getting too thin at this spot. And I'm not saying anything about the drawings. I'm just saying like, these are the types of things you need to say to someone when they are learning how to draw like this. Uh, you got to draw with your elbow, not your wrist. You, you're pushing down on the paper too hard, like all these different things. And what you're going to find is like we're going to be pushing ourselves from learning the words for this and the words for that to teaching through the language the language becomes the window to the entire world and that's where it gets really exciting but that's also where you're going to find all of your blank spots you're going to be like i don't even know how to say this you know or you know, like it reminds me of when uh, i was learning klingit and we had this immersion thing and you know, here's the honest, here's the real talk. As they say, okay, the guys go over here and you hang out with the men and the women, we're gonna be over here hanging out with the women. As I go with the guy and they all speak in English. So I was like, well, this isn't gonna help me. So then I went and, and there was quite a few of us who went over and, and they were beating. And so my auntie, she's showing me how to bead and I'm, and I also learning clink at the same time and then I, show her my beadwork and she's saying something I was like I don't understand I don't understand she says start over <laughs> so it's like so it's like oh man I'm not good at the task or the language but you know and so but there's gonna be like if we stick with it stick with it believe in it then we're sort of developing this thing where eventually there's gonna be people who come along who already know the language and now we're gonna teach them these tasks through the language which is how it used to be done and that's that's why this stuff is really interesting is i don't think there's a single lang. my theory and maybe i'm wrong i hope i'm wrong i don't think there's a language left on the northwest coast that could teach somebody how to draw in the language right i i just i don't know maybe i'm wrong maybe because there are quite a few speakers of uh nishka and i know in, in Simshan, there's, there's quite a few speakers on the coast, so maybe maybe they can. But yeah, I'm worried that nobody can. I, I know that you can't right now, 
and think it I, I couldn't tell somebody you know but then this is how you like you got to figure it out and some of this stuff you might have to manufacture how to say it but that's going to be that's the work of the group and so you start these lexicon committees and other stuff so you can get together and say how are we going to say um uh, use a pen instead of a pencil. And how, you know, like what if they're all the same word for pen, pencil, paintbrush? They're technically all the same word in Clinkit. So then you're going to have to divide those things out because once it becomes a language of use again, it's going to have to diversify incredibly. Other thoughts? Well, when I was oh. working with, um, the K high kids, um, the high school kids, I had a lesson with um, Shazabsha to draw and then Shithil to erase. I think I got those two right. Um, but I would have our vocabulary words, Shazabsha Yuta, draw the man or draw the shoal, the canoe. And then I would have another student come by and I would say Shithil to erase it. So. The, I think those are the two words that I know. I wouldn't know how to say, um, like, make the line straighter. <laughs> yeah, it's going to push us into the deep waters, but uh, that's where we got to go. And, and so, and it's the same, every program you see, they've all done this. They've, they've all been there where they're like, we didn't know how to tell kids how to, how to do them. And it could be just very... This is where it gets interesting. It could be a very cultural thing. Like we were trying to figure out like the right phrases to tell a person how to dance in a clinket style. And we had to sort of, there's still a bunch of stuff that we're not sure about. And so there are some areas where you have to get everything you can, but don't be surprised if there's some stuff you're going to have to figure out how to say. And it's just by you know learning the language and then putting those things together and it could be situations where you're saying okay that's what's going to be because we're the language community and sometimes we're what's left you know and it's not like we're just making it up any old way but you you, you got to take the language sometimes places where it hasn't been in a long time or it hasn't ever been Other thoughts, just kind of wrapping up, uh, wrapping up the day here. I wanted to share that uh, my buddies in the study group for Thinget let me try out my Thinget drills on them. And I was kind of nervous about it, but then they were all super supportive and we ran through the drills. And by the end, everybody memorized the four terms about to answer wasayiti. It was pretty cool. So gonna change. Awesome. Yeah, if, if you have a chance, uh, field test these things, keep developing these ideas, and we'll just keep thinking about some of the bigger picture things. Like, you you don't have to be alone and to figure out the entire thing. So I really like building a, a cohort, a big team of folks that's just trying to figure out how to how to do all the things together. I think historically, for whatever reason, there hasn't been enough like whole big level collaboration but I, I think it's totally up, obtainable and i think it makes a lot of sense so that we have you know as we have developed more indigenous illustrators and indigenous uh, content creators that we're just sort of looking at these things and once we've got an idea like oh yeah let's share this with the other languages so that we can take this same concept and change it do whatever you need to do but um yeah, it's really exciting to see what you folks are creating. Anything else? So I guess we'll kind of, uh, as we start shifting our focus towards Hawaii, uh, we're going to look at uh, an article from what's called the Green Book of Language Revitalization, which uh, if it's not on your shelf, uh, we're gonna we're putting together a list of texts to purchase for the Hayukatangi Dei scholars. That would certainly be one of them. Uh, yeah, absolutely. I was just reading the, the comment in the chat. 
But one of the things I want you to think of over the weekend as you're reading about the Hawaiian language um, program, and this is really the Aha Punanaleo is the language movement, and there's a whole mess of videos. If, you, if you're interested and if it helps to supplement your own learning, uh, I'll just put one example into the chat. So here's the Here's a bunch of resources for the Aha Punanaleo because at the same time they built this language nest and then a medium school, this core group of folks, they built a television company. So that's another sort of, that's a whole other aspect that we're going to start talking about as well is I believe that one of the things that's really lacking in the whole state is a statewide Alaska Native language uh, publication group, whatever entity, and also an Alaska Native Language Media Network. So the same thing, if we develop some really awesome looking animation, and then we could just do the voiceover in as many different languages as we want to. So we've got the soundtrack there, we've got the, we've got everything ready, and then we just dub over the languages. And so uh, these are things, these are big picture things, and sometimes I'm thinking about these big picture things, and sometimes I'm thinking about the smaller stuff, just like the building blocks to kind of get there. But as, as we look at the Aha Punanaleo, here's my question for you to think about over the weekend. If you built a school where the goal is to stay in the language or program, how are you going to keep people in the language? What are you going to have? What? And so for me, this, this is a big part of the culture of the program. And it seems to be a balance between expectation. Like you come here, as soon as you walk in that door, you leave the English outside. But then there's also sort of discipline. Like what happens if they don't? Um, and I've seen different examples. Uh, some that seem to work well, some that people have very uh, harsh reactions to. And then what's the incentive? So, you know, just think about those things as you're, as you're reading. Um, and yes, the, the investment. And, and then there's another, there's a thing that was in, I think, the Ojibwe reading that we did, um, which was basically saying, is the symbolic value enough? And, and just think about that. And so um, I'll find the exact quote, but it's basically like, when people learn and use the language, what do they get? And just think about it, because I think we have to think about ways to really put specific values on things. And um, we'll pick it. We'll pick up there on Monday. We'll I'll show you some examples from their school that I think were really effective. Uh, and then we'll also um, we'll start the class on Monday by listening to what happens when a school day starts at Navahi. Okay, thanks for everything, folks. Y'all are awesome. Keep doing the good work. That's the song. Oh, it needs a song. Get Ted Dogadin. Ted Dogadin.